Rosati. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Agenda with Crystal Rosati. I'm your host, Crystal. I know that you've probably been watching a lot of the shows lately. I uh, hope you have anyway. If you enjoy the content, please make sure that you're subscribing to Revolver Broadcasting on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. It really helps us. Uh, the more subscribers that we have, and we're striving to get to 1,000 subscribers. So please, please, please do that. Uh, also, make sure you're sharing, following, liking, make, making comments or asking questions because we do check that and we do go back and, and try to address your questions and comments. So please make sure you're doing that as well. And also, don't forget to check out RevolverBroadcasting.com uh, for more shows and content that you might enjoy and that you might like. Besides the agenda, because I know you like the agenda, so stay with me on that. <laughs> and then just check out the other shows that are available. Today, I wanted to come to you with something that I feel like is really important to talk about right now. Given the... Um, convictions lately, shall we say, <laughs> and also the fact we have an election coming up this year. I've had so many discussions with people on Christian citizenship, and so many people will say things to me like, well, I don't like politics. I try not to get involved in politics. I'm just not into politics. And it goes back to the fact that we've been conditioned and told that we shouldn't discuss politics and religion, right? We've, we've heard that about professional settings, personal settings, whatever. We've all been told politics and religion are topics that you shouldn't discuss. Well, who came up with that? And why are they saying that? Because here's my position. Number one, those two things make up our worldview. If you give me five minutes with somebody and I know their political persuasion or their religion, uh, religious persuasion, I can pretty much decipher how they're going to make their decisions in life going forward. Just from those two things. I built the whole show around it. Exactly. Faith, family, and politics show. That's Josh. He's the host of that show and the best producer. Uh, so make sure you're checking that show out. We do that one on a weekly basis too. But the thing is, those two things make up our worldview, and those two things are the things that tell people who we are. They describe who we are in our decision-making and our values and our morals and all that kind of stuff. They go hand in hand. Obviously, our faith should be number one, right? Our faith is number one. And I'm not trying to put politics on the same level as faith by any means. I'm telling you that politics, our, our pro political persuasion comes from our faith. We pick candidates that align with our values. And as Christians or people of faith, I'll say it generically like that, those values that we apply to politics, those go back to our faith. You cannot separate the two. So... I want to know why do you think it is they don't want us talking about that kind of stuff? Why do you think? Put it in the comments. Um, is it because, again, we've been conditioned to believe that way? The powers that be don't want us discussing these things because, in a way, those conversations lead to confessions of faith, professions of faith, salvations that occur. Um, and I think that's why the enemy is behind it and doesn't want us to discuss it. So that's just my personal feeling. I don't know how you feel about it. Put a comment down and let me know. Um, there's another reason I think people say that, and it's, it's using faith in the wrong way. So they think that faith alone is enough, so they don't need to be involved in politics. All right? That is a very, very dangerous way of thinking as well especially as an American, and I'll tell you why. Because in America, we the people are the authority. We're supposed to be the authority, not the people in Washington. They work for us. They're supposed to do what we want as, as a society, right? So if we are not involved in politics, we're totally shirking that responsibility that God set up for us when this country was founded. What if David said... I don't need to go fight Goliath. God will take care of it. I have faith. What would have happened then? 
What if Joseph said that when God told him to store up grain for six years because a famine was coming? What if he just said, "Mm, God's got it. I got faith. He'll take care of it. What if Noah said that when God told him to build the ark because rain was coming and there was going to be a flood? When there had never been a flood before. And if I recall correctly, I don't think it had rained before. So imagine how stupid he sounded to the to the people around when he's saying, I gotta build this ark because rain's coming and there's gonna be a flood, right? What if he didn't do that and he just said, Oh, I have faith, God will take care of it. And he didn't obey. He didn't take the responsibility. What about people like Nehemiah, who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, or Esther? who became queen and saved her people from destruction? What about Daniel, who defied the king, although he didn't show any kind of negativity towards the king? He was kind about it, but he did ignore the king and defy him. Or the Roman centurion soldier um, that was a pagan, he was a soldier for the pagan leader Caesar that came to Jesus in faith. Or Nicodemus, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus in the middle of the night asking questions about how to be saved. What if, what if you are a professing Christian and you've had a salvation experience? What if at the time you became a Christian, you said, eh, God will take care of it, I got faith, and didn't make that decision? We have responsibilities. <laughs> we have to live up to them. We have a part to play. And we can't ignore that. In Deuteronomy 16, 18 through 20, God tells his people what to do. Let's go with slide one, Josh. Thank you. Um, The Bible says, You shall appoint for yourself judges and officers in all your towns, which the Lord your God is giving you, according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not distort justice. You shall not be partial. And you shall not take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Now, that set of verses right there, I think it's pretty clear. God says you shall (laughs) appoint judges and officers in your towns. Is that not political? Is that not an election in essence? Hmm. People say you can't mix religion and politics, and I'm telling you it's in the Bible there. It's actually throughout the Bible in the stories that I mentioned before, but this is pretty clear here that God told the people to set up and appoint these people and not be partial and make sure they judge with righteous judgment. I think, personally, if we had been obeying these laws or these directions from God all along, we wouldn't be in this culture war that we're in right now or in the chaos that we're in. In 1 Samuel 8, We learn of how the Israelites wanted a king, like the pagan nations around them. They wanted to be like the pagans. I'm going to read some passages to you out of 1 Samuel 8, but first I want to just kind of talk to you about how God tried to warn them against it. He didn't want them to have a king. He knew what was best for them. He reminded them that they answered to him alone. Uh, Samuel was angry that the people wanted a king, and he went to God about it. And God told him the people didn't reject him, but instead they rejected God. So God saw the whole political um, appointment of a king as initially a judgment against him, a rejection of him. But he told Samuel that the people, despite all he had done for them, served other gods. So he told Samuel, listen to him. And explain to them what kind of king they would have. And this is what Samuel said. This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons. And I want you to listen to all this and figure out, hmm, can we make relation to this today? He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. That's armies, right? He will appoint him captains and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instrument of war, and he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and cooks and bakers, and he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. Eminent domain, anyone? (laughs) 
and and he will take your men servants, maid servants, best young men, and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep taxes, and you will be his servants. Do we not? Are we not servants at this point to our government? We work and we pay taxes to them, and then they do what they want with it. And they feel like they can raise the taxes anytime they want. They can use it for whatever they want. It doesn't benefit us because they're sending a lot of it overseas to other countries. I don't know about you. I'm feeling a financial hurt right now. Are you? I, I don't have any government handouts waiting for me or anybody trying to help me, but yet I'm doing my fair share. Even on unemployment, I'm paying taxes. <laughs> Our, our elderly on Social Security pay taxes. It's ridiculous. And then, don't get me started on the tax that's taxed, that's taxed, that's taxed. Because, you know, we have, we have a dollar we make from a company that already paid tax on it. <laughs> we pay tax on that same dollar. We go use it at the store and they pay tax. On, well, we pay tax on what we buy then they pay tax on the dollar they earned, what's left? Seriously, how much of a dollar is actually money versus tax at this point? It's crazy. Okay, so let's get back to the word. You shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye ye shall have chosen you. So you did it to yourself is what he's saying. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us that we may also be like all the nations, <laughs> and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. The reason I chuckled at that point about we may be like all the nations, this does not sound like the United Nations to you. I mean, I'm seeing so many similarities to when the Israelites wanted a king to what we're seeing happen now, although our country is supposed to be set up differently. Like I said, we are supposed to be the people, the government. The representatives represent us. They work for us. It doesn't matter if they're in the Congress or Senate. They work for us, but we've got that flipped upside down somehow over time. Anyways, the Israelites Israelites persisted, so God gave them what they wanted. He set up a government structure for them, and he told Samuel to anoint Saul as king. Again, we don't have a king, but we do have a representative government. Our founding fathers knew that a king would not be good for us, which is why they set it up the way they did, because... A, as a king, you just simply have too much power. And absolute power absolutely corrupts. So they set up the three branches, executive, legislative, and judicial. They are supposed to exist to balance the power and to ensure the rights of the citizens. That's their purpose. But also, by having the three branches, you keep the power in check. Governments do tend over time to become corrupt because they're humans. (laughs) Human nature, meaning greed, power, etc., becomes mixed in. And when a nation becomes less godly, the humanistic side tends to fill in the void. So you take God out, and then human nature overtakes. A sinful human nature seems to overtake where God is missing. I get it. Our country's left God far behind, and we see it in the government now. We've embraced not only sin, but celebration of sinful lifestyles as evidenced by this month. And if you don't know, I'm talking about Pride Month. We've degraded into chaos. I think everyone can agree that our society is chaotic at this point. We've stood idly by and we've allowed it. And now we want nothing to do with it as Christians because it's gone too far astray. But whose fault is that? Let me ask you, whose fault is it? Do we blame the secular non-Christians for what they've done to our country? Or do we take blame for allowing it to happen by allowing ourselves to be convinced that we shouldn't be involved in politics? I remember as a child I started hearing that. 
we shouldn't talk about politics or religion in public places or in the workplace. I did fall prey to that myself, so I'm not judging anyone. I did fall prey to that myself for a while. I thought it was wisdom at the time. I was young, right? But then I've realized that politics are actively a part of our religion or should be. We have, again, a responsibility as people of faith to put people in charge of stewarding our country, our money, our finances, our, our military, the, our borders. The most important things to protect this country should be people that we put in charge that share our values, that want to protect the citizens. Switching off a little bit, God created order in our existence. He is a God of order and structure. He created the family first, then government, then the church in that order in in the Bible. So I think that's really important to note. I believe the family was created like the Trinity, father, mother, children. Um, I believe... And I think it's kind of simplistic. I might be too simplistic. But I believe the way the Trinity works, God is the last name, for example. And you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Just like in a family, you know, Smith might be the last name. But you have John, June, and Elizabeth. Three different people with the same last name. I I kind of think God created us in his image. And by that... The way he set up the family unit is created in his image. So I think there's a correlation there. And then he created government because, like I said, the Israelites wanted it. Although I will say, you know, because the pagan nations had kings before that, um, he, he, he created the government structure as we know it much later. However, the original governance model was the man's the head, <laughs> and then the wife, and then the children. So you have God as the head of the family. You have the husband as the head of the, the natural family, and then the wife is second in command, and then the children, right? The husband and wife, he's not more valuable than the woman or anything like that. I was explaining to my friend, when the Bible talks about women are to submit to their husbands, People want to tout that, but they forget the first part of the verse that says husbands are to love their wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Okay, so there's so the man has the first responsibility to the woman, then the woman is to submit. But when it says submit, it's not obey. It's not the same word. And as I was explaining to my friend, a man who loves his wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it is going to consult his wife. Okay, that's number one. Number two, he'll take her input into consideration. They are partnering, right? And as you discuss something as a couple, you nine times out of ten come to the same conclusion. That's how it should work. It's not that he is the authority over the woman, although he does hold the responsibility and accountability for the family unit in God's eyes, he holds that. He, it's not a controlling type of thing. If you have a man who's godly and who's right, it's very easy to fall into that womanly role that's godly and right and to have a solid unit, okay? So, so in that respect, the family unit was a government structure, and then later came the political government structure and then the church. And if you realize churches are set up the same way, it's, it's a model that God set up. Let's go to slide two. I'm going to talk about this book because this is a book that I'm going to use through this podcast as a reference. I did research and I love this book. It's called On Christian, On Christian Citizenship and it's by Kurt Smith with the Indiana Family Institute. I I decided God laid this topic on my heart a while ago, but I, I had other things I wanted to get through first. And, and so I'm at the point where I've talked about all the things that I had mapped out to talk about. And this feel, feels like the very next thing, like I said earlier, that was necessary based on recent convictions and the election coming up. 
and I wanted to give it early enough to where it could be shared throughout so we have a better election outcome, I hope. (laughs) I'm not going to go one side or the other. I'm a Christian, so I'm going to go God. In fact, in the past, I've had a Jesus 2020 sign in my yard. That was a political sign (laughs) because I didn't want to promote one candidate over the other. I firmly believe that as a Christian, if you start with the platforms of the parties, that's enough to tell you which side of of the aisle you should be on. And I'll just leave it at that. So I like the way the, the... that government's explained in this book. The way it describes it is government protects and preserves life on this earthly plane. Its focus is on preserving and protecting life, promoting that which leads to good life, and restraining that which harms life. When this works as designed, the creator smiles at godly offspring. And I love the way that's worded because that tells you right there, it aligns with the founding documents as to what the government's role is. And if you really take that literally, that those statements that I just read, there are a lot of things in our society right now that don't go along with that. A lot of things. Abortion is one of them. The part that says preserving and protecting life, promoting that which leads to the good life, and restraining that which harms life. Kind of excludes abortion right there, doesn't it? Whole nother topic, again, not judging people who have had them. (laughs) Trust me, I understand. It's not that I'm not empathetic to that. It's just there is a right way and a wrong way to live, and that's not in the right way. Order and structure, to me, are the prevention of chaos. That's what you need, order and structure. That comes from God. Chaos comes from the devil. And we as people need the order and structure because that's how God created us. We need to have that in our life. When our life falls into chaos, that's where you get the discouragement. You get disheartened. You get depressed. You have desperation. You have anxiety. It's because of chaos. But ultimately, God gave us our American government to prevent chaos, thus preventing us from going through the heartache of those things mentioned above. It was our responsibility to keep it. And I don't feel like we've done a good job at that. Even our court systems are in place to create order and structure. They're supposed to resolve disputes. That doesn't seem (laughs) very prevalent lately because we have a lot of activist judges and lawyers that are simply seeking their own desires, causing the chaos. They want greed to be rewarded. They want power they're, they're seeking after those things, alignment with people who can make their lives better or who can give them a leg up, right, instead of doing what's right. But in the words of Benjamin Franklin in 1787, he, when he was asked if we have a republic or a monarchy, he said a republic if you can keep it. Can we keep it? Have we kept it? I don't know. It's interesting to me that somewhere along the line, society started referring to us as a democracy instead of a republic. Why do you think that happened? By definition, a republic is a form of government where the individual is represented. A republic has a charter that protects individual rights against a majority, as opposed to a democracy, which is mob rule. It's ruled by the majority. Now, why do you think, do you think that was a strategic move in our society that they started calling us a democracy? I do. And if you've watched my shows before, you know about the communist goals. If you have it, you need to go back and watch them. You know about the United Nations and the push for unity across the globe, across all nations, putting the United Nations in charge of everything, the one world government you haven't watched them, you need to go back and watch them. There is an agenda. <laughs> I hate to keep I hate to keep throwing that out there. No, I don't. It's why we name the show the agenda. But there is an agenda behind it. And the agenda is as society degrades through poor education, through taking God out of everything, becoming a godless society, 
which by nature is going to throw us into chaos. We saw chaos in the summer of love, didn't we? We've seen chaos in our government. We've seen chaos in our court systems. We've seen chaos in our schools. All you got to do is go to Reddit and look up the subreddit teachers and read their stories of kids attacking them physically in their classrooms, kids cussing them out. Go hang out at a school playground for a while. There's one behind my house. I talked about it before. Kids throwing the F-bomb everywhere and GD and fighting. There is chaos in our society. I think (laughs) Obama said never let a crisis go to waste. That indicated to me that he had an agenda. Um, And I think that is the point of all of this. Why did we change from republic to democracy all of a sudden? And it wasn't all of a sudden, but it feels like it to me because it's happened over my lifetime. I look back and I'm like, when did this start? I didn't even catch it when it started. That's how asleep we've been. The reason for that is because if you can get a godless society as the majority, then guess what? Christianity doesn't matter. Faith doesn't matter. You've now got a government that's going to rule by the popular vote, the majority. How many times in in a prior election did we hear, but she won the popular vote as opposed to the electoral college vote that she didn't win? They kept referring back to the popular vote. Do you not see that as a a push for this agenda? (laughs) I mean, if you look back, I don't know, it's always Monday what do, what do they say? Monday morning quarterbacking? Okay. Thanks, Josh. Monday morning quarterbacking is, is so easy to do in hindsight, right? Hindsight's twenty twenty. But at the time, we don't catch it because we're not looking for it. And we need to wake up, folks. The media, government officials, they all like to call us a democracy. In fact, I've heard... I've heard Republicans call us a democracy. It irritates me all the time. Do they not understand the impact of that? They think it's just a word. There is a lot of meaning behind that. But frankly, it's easier for them. Think about it. If a representative just has to worry about the majority in their district, doesn't it make their job easier? They don't have to work as hard. They don't have to think as much. They don't have to protect individual rights. They just go with what the majority wants. Um, And by restricting our laws to only protecting the rights of individuals, our government would most likely need to be smaller, folks. We wouldn't need it to be so large. We have rights that allow us to pursue things, but not guarantee things and hand them to us. Our Bill of Rights did not give us the right to happiness and life and whatever. It gave us the right to pursue happiness. It gave us the right to life, but the right to pursue happiness, not hand it over to us. And the only, the only exception to that is protection from invasions. That's obviously on a bigger scale and infrastructure, I would argue. That's the government's job, protect individual rights. We already have the Bill of Rights. It lays it out. And infrastructure and security. We would not need a huge government if those were the only things we focused on. Um, We wouldn't need to pay as many taxes if we weren't sending our money over to other countries. Just saying. And not taking care of our people here, our veterans and so on. We also hear a lot about getting rid of the Electoral College and just having a popular vote. I referenced that earlier. We had somebody that... The media kept saying she won the popular vote, though. Like that was something to, to behold. Like it had any footing whatsoever. And then they went on to call for the abolishment of the Electoral College. Okay. That's an assault, if you ask me, on our government. Because the Electoral College is in place to prevent a majority from ruling. It's purposeful. It's intentional. It goes back to the republic versus democracy. We were formed as a republic because of individual rights being protected. 
All right. So get rid of the electoral college to me and go to popular vote. That is truly sealing the deal that we're now a democracy, which is majority rule. I don't want that. I don't know about you. We have to do something about that, right? Let's briefly be reminded of our founding documents. Um, This is the Constitution. Let's put up slide three. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it, folks, because I think people forget. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Okay, here's some thoughts on that. First of all, when it says justice, establish justice is what it says. That's the primary job of government. But we've observed it become corrupt. We know this. It's corrupt. I don't care which side of the aisle on it, you're on. If you don't like Trump and you like Joe Biden, you're going to say it was unjust for what they did to Hunter. And if you like Trump and you don't like Biden, then it's unjust what they did to Trump. I think we can all agree at this point it's not just. <laughs> No matter how you look at it, no matter which side you're on, I think it's becoming very clear. What about when the government officials created a bail fund to bail out criminals over George Floyd riots? Should they have done that? Should they have, is that justice? I don't think so. There's no accountability for the Russia collusion fake narrative. None. There's been no accountability. Let me say it again. No accountability. Prosecutors immediately releasing criminals and not pressing charges. Is that promoting justice? Mm -mm. And there's so many more examples. So the primary job of government is justice there, and we're not doing it. We can all agree it's not happening. Justice is not being served by our representatives. The next thing it says is ensure domestic tranquility. Okay, I want you to note that In the wording, it says insure, I-N-S-U-R-E, versus insure, E-N-S-U-R-E. To insure with an I means that a party agrees to compensate another party in the event of a certain loss, damage, or injury. It's a guarantee. While the insure with an E means we'll try. (laughs) We'll try to make sure that happens. The Constitution says insure with an I. That means you can count on it. It's a guarantee. Domestic tranquility. Have we seen that? No. Again, go back to the summer of love. They allowed that to happen. Look at the protests over Palestine. I I can't even say Palestine. It's not a country, first of all. But Gaza, the protests over Gaza, that's not ensuring domestic tranquility. Even the January 6th, no matter which aisle you're on, this week, Nancy Pelosi admitted it was her responsibility that she failed in calling the National Guard in. Okay? That was not domestic tranquility. It wasn't insured there. So what are they doing? They're not promoting justice. They're not insuring domestic tranquility. What about the common defense? That's the next thing it mentions. Can we say borders? I think that's enough. What about crime not being punished? That's that's not ensuring our common defense. Now, do you know that Russia has uh, warships off of Cuba now? As of this week, they moved they moved a ship, a military ship off of Cuba. Are we not reliving this again? <laughs> I mean, that do you understand Cuba's 50 miles from Florida? It's not that far. Why are they doing that? They're angry with us over Ukraine. It's a it's a show of force. It's a warning. Where's the common defense there? What about all the illegals that are coming in and committing crimes against people that are citizens? And they're rolling them through the revolving door of the court system and the justice system, letting them back out. I don't know how many stories there are 
up to five times somebody was arrested and let go, and then they kill somebody. And they find out they're an illegal immigrant. What are they doing, folks? General welfare promotion. This one's tricky, but I want to, I want to tell you this does not say welfare compensation <laughs> or welfare guarantee. It's a promotion of general welfare that's different. So what this means is that the government should encourage the public in ways to ensure their own welfare. They're, they're dishing out our tax dollars for that, for people who already paid theirs off or their kids off, or people who work in the trades who never got to go to college because they couldn't afford it now you know, have to pay for somebody else to go to college to get a liberal arts degree that they can't use anywhere. I mean, what is the government doing to encourage and promote general wel- welfare? And I'm going to go a step further. That's, that's like financial stuff. But general welfare isn't just financial. General welfare means well-being, okay? Well-being of the population. What are they doing for that? Another thing is secure the blessings of liberty. Freedoms are being taken away little by little. I think anybody who's my age or older has seen that. Maybe younger. I think the, the <clears throat> should I say, Gen Z and below is probably so used to it that they don't see it anymore. <laughs> and that's the sad thing. And I'm just going to throw this in there because it just made me laugh. Remember when the Slurpees were banned in New York City? <laughs> I mean, you couldn't buy a 32-ounce Slurpee anymore because that's just way too much. You have to buy something smaller. It's so dumb. I want my big gulp. (laughs) Josh wants his big gulp. (laughs) Essentially, what we've experienced is we're, we're frogs in the boiling water. There's no way else around it. We've just been frogs in the boiling water. The agenda's been there for a long time. We've seen it happen little by little by little. Um... We haven't noticed it at the time, but now I think people are starting to wake up and and lots of different alternative news people are talking about these things and, and I really think we're starting to wake up, so I'm hopeful about that. Now let's go to the Declaration of Independence, slide four. This one says, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalien- un- I always have trouble with that unalienable rights that among these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness again pursuit of happiness <laughs> we're supposed to be guaranteed life and liberty which is freedom but not happiness just the pursuit of happiness but again all men are created equal endowed by a creator um, with with the unalienable rights. Uh, la, la, la. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, moving on, slide five. This says that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their dust powers from the consent of the governed. This is where we say they're instituted among men, and deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. That's us. We, the people, are the government leaders. We're in charge. We're the authority of how our policies work. And we, as Christian members of society, not only hold responsibility to participate in government, but also to represent godly principles in government. How do we do that? We get involved. We make a phone call. We send an email. We run for school board. We run for uh, treasurer. We run for secretary of the state, whatever. Let's go to slide six. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute a new government. I'm not going to comment on this part because of, you know, the powers that be. <laughs> But it's pretty obvious, and you should know that part. So I'm just pointing it out to you. I'm just the messenger. (laughs) Um, So we've had our government for over 200 years now. 
politicians have become power hungry. We've seen that happen. And instead of doing what's right by the people, they just make new laws. Here are some of the dumb laws that exist on the books still. In Connecticut, it's illegal to eat raw onions while walking down the street. In Texas, there's an onion curfew. (laughs) Young women are not allowed to have any raw onions after 6 p.m. Did you know that? In Oklahoma and Ohio, you can't make faces at a dog. Now, some of these, I'm like, how can they enforce these? They should have never been on the books to begin with. I guess if you only have like 50 people in your town back in the 1800s, you could enforce it. But, you know, not now. Here's another one. In California, it's illegal to eat a frog that died while competing in a frog jumping competition. (laughs) In Florida, it's illegal to sing in your swimsuit. I bet a lot of people would be going to jail for that because they got the headphones on or the earbuds in and they're singing away and I'm going to start reporting them. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) When I go to the beach, I'm going to be looking for you. So watch out. I'm just kidding. Um, But that goes to show you how many of these laws are still on the books. And so what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make here is they never take laws away. (laughs) They just keep adding more and more. Why? Because it's a full-time job for them now. In the beginning, it wasn't. It was something they voluntarily did. Okay? They wanted to do it. They wanted to protect the country. They wanted to ensure that we had freedoms, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's a paid job. And it's not just paid 120000 like we think is on the books for, you know, a congressman or whatever. It's all the perks that go along with it that make them millionaires and billionaires by the time they leave office. Anyways, mankind has taken the power of the government to the extreme. And these laws are never removed from the books. They never seem to to get rid of any. You got to do it in your Trump voice. They never turn the cameras around. (laughs) They never get rid of the laws. (laughs) Thanks, Josh. Um, Ultimately, it comes down to corruption. Uh, We have prosecutors and officials that seem to decide on when and where they're going to enforce the laws. So that's a whole nother ballgame. We have activists in power of prosecution, like prosecutors, or even law enforcement officers, or, you know, the three-letter agencies in D.C. that get to decide when they're going to enforce them and on whom. So we don't have fair justice there at all. We have chaos. Then we have representatives in D.C. that are abusing their power. Again, chaos. We have three-letter agencies abusing their power. Chaos. And we have judges that are using activism instead of the law to execute their judicial duties. Chaos. We've allowed the removal of God from public schools and prayer from schools. We've allowed abortion. We've allowed gay marriage. We've allowed the theory of evolution to replace creation in schools. So now kids think they're animals and they're acting like them. We've allowed obscenity in schools. So we perverted the minds of our children. We've allowed gender ideology to take over. So our kids are all confused uh, about what they even are. We've allowed a breakdown in our criminal system and all of it leads to chaos. Um, Again, we've been reviewing the the communist goals in the other podcast episodes. And the reason why is because they're a map of how to take down a society and make it a communist society. Destroy it. Well, we've seen how many of those goals have been achieved already in the former episodes. And we've also reviewed many of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and we've seen how those have infiltrated our own government. We've turned over much of our sovereignty to a collaboration of global countries. We have government officials who are more allegiant to the UN than to the US. So why have we allowed this? Why have we the people allowed this? And why are we continuing to allow it? Here's some of the things that God asks us to do, some of our responsibilities as Christians. Number one, take care of widows and orphans. Number two, take care of the elderly or our parents. Um, We can find that through the Ten Commandments. 
but yet we've relied on Medicare and Medicaid instead. And we're told to educate our children, but yet we ship them off to government schools to be trained by secularists who don't believe in God and don't want God in, in the building. We're supposed to help the poor, but instead we depend on welfare and government aid and tax, taxes instead of our own money. We've allowed the taxes to be raised to do the welfare and government aid so we don't have to. The Ten Commandments, we're supposed to follow them. But does this only mean that we ensure that we follow them or that our family, our community, and our country follows them? Think about that. Is it an individual responsibility? Or are we supposed to ensure that our kids do too and our families do too and our community does too and our country does too? What do you think God wants? How do we even have a standard for morality without the Ten Commandments? Which is, again, why we're in chaos, because they're taking that away. Everything's relative. Your truth, my truth, not the truth. My situation is different than yours, so you don't understand. It's relative to me, my circumstances. Um, No, there has to be a standard. Will there be exceptions? Yes. And you deal with those on a one-by-one basis, but you don't make laws To the exceptions, you make laws for the rule. Okay, so we can't even seem to do that because we get so caught up in exceptions. But what if, what if, (laughs) but what if? Well, that's outside the standard. (laughs) That's an outlier. We don't need to talk about that. We'll deal with that on a one-by-one basis. But, but why can't we even get anyone to make a call to their representatives or send them an email? Have you given up so much faith in, in that even working that you're just willing to lay down and die and let it happen? I mean, it's not a lot to ask at all. So why can't you do it? Here's what people don't seem to grasp. You doing it by yourself, yeah, it may not make a difference. But you and 500 people at your church doing it, that'll make a difference. You and the other 1,000 subscribers to Revolver Broadcasting <laughs> doing it will make a difference. There's, there's a rule, and I forget exactly what it is, but it's like you contact five people who contact five people who contact five people, and, and before long you have, you know, a massive amount of people. Um that's what we need to do. The left is so good at doing it. We are terrible at doing it on the right. We're so individually minded that we can't see a collective at all. But there is value to a collective. Okay, so we have to change. Why have we become so comfortable and complacent that we don't care anymore? Have we become cold to the responsibility that we carry in keeping our shining city on a hill for the world to emulate? Do you want to let go of that? Have you already let go of that? Have we forgotten our compassion for others and protecting peace and tranquility, and therefore we're playing a part in expanding the chaos? Have we become lovers of darkness rather than lovers of light? So I'm going to close, and I want to challenge you. I want you to see the need that we have for you to stand up and be courageous to be bold. I want you to know that you do, in fact, matter, and you make a difference. Don't believe the lies that we're outnumbered and what we do no longer matters. Don't let the majority rule. Our country's at stake. Our heritage is at stake. Our children are at stake. Our future is at stake. And these are high risk for all of us. John Stuart Mill, a utilitarian philosopher, delivered an 1867 inaugural address at the University of St. Andrews. He stated, let's put up slide seven, let not anyone pacify his conscience by the delusion that he can do no harm if he takes no part and forms no opinion. Bad men need nothing more to come past their ends than that good men should look on and do nothing. He is not a good man who, without a protest, allows wrong to be committed in his name, 
and with the means which he helps to supply because he will not trouble himself to use his mind on the subject. So stand up, be counted, be brave, pray, run for office, make a phone call, send an email, become responsible for your own government. With that, I'm going to thank you for joining in with the episode, for watching it. If you like this content, please go to revolverbroadcasting.com, the website. Subscribe there for um, emails. Uh, You can send us contact forms, and we can respond and correspond back and forth. Like this video. Share this video. Follow on Rumble. Subscribe on any other uh, app that you're using. Um, And make sure that you post a comment or a question because that helps move this up in the algorithm. And really, really share because we're trying to get to 1,000 subscribers. So remember, sharing is caring. (laughs) And with that, I thank you for watching. Thank you for your time and your energy and effort. And thank you for what you're going to do to stand up for your country. Good night.